Okay. So it looks like it's still just the five of us right now. So uh, um, well, that's unfortunate. Can anybody verify that it's, oh, no, there are others here. Can anyone verify that it's recording? Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining in. Thank you, Joe. Hi. Thank you, everyone, for joining in our uh, Lionside chat webinar for this afternoon. We will begin um, at four o'clock. So please just say hello if you want. Um, we're going to just ask that you be patient with us while we get started in a few minutes. To all of those of you that are just joining us, uh, please feel free to sit back and relax, grab a glass of water or some tea or whatever it is, your beverage of choice, and just sit back and relax. We'll be getting started with our line side chat in roughly two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second of our Lionside Side Chats this summer. My name is Dawn Pfeiffer Wrights, and I'm Assistant Teaching Professor in Communication Arts and Sciences at Penn State Berks, and I'm also the CAS 100 Coordinator. And I'm one of the three folks from our campus that are um, working hard to bring you these uh, Lionside Side Chats throughout the summer and hopefully into the fall and spring as well. I work alongside Sonia De La Cueto from the Learning Center and Dr. Ryan Hassler, also Associate, Associate Teaching Professor, and we are excited to have with us today another one of our esteemed faculty members. Uh, so this is our second Lionside chat, so we are hoping that we have no technical glitches, but if we do, uh, please bear with us. Um, we are excited to welcome, excuse me, we are excited to welcome um, Dr. Tamley Meisterwick today, and I'm trying to to advance. There we go. Um, Tammy is uh, very excited to be presenting and she's going to be telling us some really unique, interesting information about viruses. Um, we're excited to be able to welcome you into our program. Um, throughout the session, we ask that if you do have questions and answers, you can go ahead and put them into the Q&A feature of our Zoom webinar and uh, my colleagues will be facilitating those. We will most likely reserve all of our question asking until the end uh, when Dr. Meislewick is done presenting. We will uh, then call upon the questions and get some of those answers for us. At the end of our session today, we will be uh, providing a survey and, and your feedback is very much appreciated through that survey. It'll help us guide how we are working through the line side chats and it will also helpfully give us some information to present different chats in the future. 
Um, so the, just one final reminder, we're also recording today's session so you can revisit this topic or even share with uh, your friends and family members if you had a really good experience. So that being said, I'm going to stop sharing my slide. I am going to ask Tammy, Dr. Meisluk, to share her slide. And then Tammy, when you are ready to go, I will give you the thumbs up and you may begin. Alrighty, let me just get all set up here. All right, I think I'm right. set. You're ready, thank you. Great, thank you. And thank you all for coming to this Lionside chat and thank you Dawn for that really nice introduction. Today I wanna to talk a little bit about viruses. I've spent nearly 25, ooh, 25 years working on just one virus. And the virus that I work on doesn't harm or bother us. In fact, it infects bacteria. And hopefully, as you'll see at, uh, during the last part of this presentation, uh, these viruses actually provide uh, the medical field with some beneficial outcomes. So let's get started. So what is a virus? I, I put up here that viruses are the most abundant biomass on Earth. And in parentheses, I put alive. And that's because scientists really question whether or not viruses are living things. And as we go through this presentation, we'll have a chance to address that question as well. Um, but they are the most abundant biomass on Earth. And so let's think about this in terms of actual numbers. And if you uh, think about the numbers of viral particles that are estimated to populate the earth, you have to think of a really large number. And that is, um, this is for our math friends. Um, if you multiply a billion, which is 10 to the ninth, by a billion, which is 10 to the ninth, and then multiply that number by 10 trillion, which is 10 to the 13th power, that brings us to 10 to the 31st power. That's an estimate of how many viral particles are um, present on the earth at this particular point in time. And that calculation actually comes uh, as a regular standard calculation. So that's prior to the pandemic. So my guess is that that number is much higher than, um, than the 10 to the 31st power. Viruses are considered uh, microscopic parasites, the actual ultimate microscopic parasite. And you'll see why, um, hopefully, as again, through the talk. They're generally smaller than bacteria. And um, I use the word generally because there have been some viruses that have been identified to be as big as bacteria. And the same is true for most biological processes um, or phenomena. There's usually a set pattern or rule, but there's always exceptions to that as we'll see as we go throughout the talk. Um, one of the key things about virus is viruses is that they lack the ability to reproduce without a host and that becomes really important and a key feature when we start deciding whether or not viruses are alive or not and of late they have a, uh, a reputation for contagion so when did viruses get discovered when did we discover when did we start learning and understanding viruses so in the late 1800s we knew about bacteria because we knew we could see bacteria with our um, light microscopes. And we knew a little bit about the cause and effect in terms of bacteria cause disease. And we started to become aware of uh, general health and sanitation and the idea that poor sanitation led to more bacteria, which led to more diseases. So in the late 1800s, we had a sense of cause and effect. Um, but we didn't know about viruses yet. And in the 1890s, there was a, a German chemist who was an agricultural researcher. And he did a really pivotal experiment. And the experiment that he did was he was an, uh, working with uh, tobacco plants and he had noticed that there was diseased tobacco plants in the field. And so he brought back some of the diseased leaves and he took those leaves and cut them up and ground them up and made it an extract, something he called noxious juice. And then he took that noxious juice and he injected it into healthy tobacco plants. And as we know, right, and as we would expect, if you take unhealthy plants and it, take stuff from them and in, 
put them into healthy plants that they would get diseased. And sure enough, they did. And he drew two conclusions from that observation. Um, the first conclusion was correct. And this first conclusion was that the noxious juice that he took from the diseased plants was carried some kind of disease agent. And, and it was transferable from one plant to the other through that juice, which was true. Um, the other conclusion he made was that the disease that was in the tobacco, that was causing the tobacco plants was a bacterial in origin. And that wasn't true. And so um, it turns out that um, it's caused by a virus. And we really didn't know that much about viruses really until the mid 1900s when the uh, electron microscope became useful in, in the research labs. And what you see on this slide here is an electron micrograph of the tobacco mosaic virus. And this particular virus on this image is magnified 160,000 times. And so you can see that it turns out that the causative agent was not bacterial, but actually viral in nature. So we need an electron microscope to see them. So how big or better question, I guess, is how small are viruses? So David Wessner, who is a biologist, uh, a, prof a bio professor of biology at, at Davidson College, wrote an article for a journal called Nature Education, and he had a really good analogy. And I, I really love this analogy. Um, and it helps me, and I think hopefully it'll help you visualize how small viruses really are. So he, he, it t if you take your palm of your hand and, and envision in the palm of your hand a grain of salt, so we can see a grain of salt with our naked eye. And imagine that, that, that grain of salt in your hand. Now imagine the size of a virus. And the example that he used in his analogy uh, was a polio virus. So the polio virus compared to that grain of salt is 10,000 times smaller than the grain of salt that you can see with your naked eye. So, really, really small. They're very small. You can't see them with your naked eye. And one of the things that um, is kind of fun to do is I, I really like this website that I have on this slide. The, it's learn.genetics.utah.edu. And this particular one is scale. Um, but this particular site has a, a lot of STEM information that's really approachable and accessible to, to everybody. And this scale um, site has a, um, an interactive size uh, scale that you can kind of look and see and move around to compare the sizes of viruses to the size of a baseball or to a cancer cell. So it's, it's, it's a fun interactive um, uh, website. So if you have time and you're interested in really comparing sizes, uh, check out that site. So if viruses are so small, um, how can we see them? Or how do we see them? And so I, I like this slide, and, and I already alluded to the uh, electron micrograph uh, slides. And so um, this particular slide I really like because it is a picture of an E. coli cell. So if you look here, this is the outside cell wall of an E. coli, a single E. coli, and these circular kind of, I don't know what you want to call them, wormy looking things, are individual virus particles binding to and infecting a bacterial cell. So there's hundreds of them infecting just one single cell. And this micrograph is magnified approximately 200,000 times. And again, just kind of telling us how small um, viruses really, really are. So what do viruses look like? Um, of the millions of different viral species, and there are millions of different viral species um, so far. So far, we've only really been able to characterize about 5,000 uh, uh, in any detail whatsoever. And as you can see from this slide, viruses come in many shapes and many different sizes. Um, although they're all small, um, they are infectious. And to date, we have not found a, an organism on earth that hasn't had some kind of 
virus associated with it either today or in its past. And so um, by what I mean by in its past is that we can look at the genomes of organisms and see remnants of viral infection in the genomes of, of, of organisms. And we have not found an organism yet that either doesn't have an associated virus with it or um, virus in its genome, viral remnants of a virus. So even the, and even though there's many of these different types of viruses um, and there's none of them actually work in precisely the same way. So there's a little bit different the way they replicate or the way they infect. Um, so we consider viruses when we think about them and talk about them as simple, but also very complicated. And so let's look and see um, at virus, look at viruses. So again, they look different and there's millions of different types of viruses. There are, however, some common features of viruses and I wanna talk a little bit about what those features are. And so if you look at this slide here, there's actually um, broken down into the parts. And, and so this is the innermost part of a virus. And what you see here is the nucleic acid of the virus that contains the genes or the genome of the virus. But that could be complicated too, because viruses could be um, made up, of, their genetic material could be DNA or RNA, and it could be double-stranded DNA, like the DNA in our cells, They're, that's double-stranded, or it can be composed of single-stranded DNA, which is like bacterial genomes, those are single-stranded DNA, or it could be double-stranded DNA or single-stranded single stranded RNA or double-stranded RNA. So again, viruses are simple, but there's definitely a layer of complexity to them. The next arrow, the arrow here, points to the, um, what, what's called the capsid. And the capsid is made up of protein. And the protein is different for almost every different virus. And, but that protein adds a layer of protection to, um, to the nucleic acid. So its job is to protect and bind to and protect the nucleic acid. Now some viruses, not all viruses, but some viruses have this outer shell called an envelope. And the envelope is really made up of two components. The first component is a fat or a specialized, a specialized fat called a phospholipid. And that's this part here. And then it's made up of specialized proteins called glycoproteins. And glycoproteins are proteins that have sugars attached to them. And those become really important when we talk about uh, viruses binding to cells because viruses, in many cases, use those proteins to bind to the host cell. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail when we talk about infection. Now, some viruses have an envelope and some viruses do not. And if you have a, uh, an envelope, you're called an envelope virus. Scientists sometimes aren't, are pretty good at naming things. And if you don't have um, an envelope, you're considered a naked virus. So, so we saw that there's those three parts of this virus that are kind of similar, but they can assemble into kind of different shapes and sizes. So there's really four, actually there's three uh, main structural categories of viruses. And then the fourth one is kind of the catch-all for everything else that doesn't really fit into those other three categories. So the simplest of the four is what's in the center, and that's here. And so that is, those types of viruses fall into the category called helical viruses. And they look like long rods, right? You can see that they have the nucleic acid. In this case, the nucleic acid is made up of single-stranded RNA and has um, these proteins kind of surrounding it to, to protect it, right? That's the kind of the middle protection part. The, we've already seen an example of this. The example was that tobacco mosaic virus that I showed you on the second slide or the third slide. And um, Ebola also falls into this category, these helical type viruses. The other category or the next category is the viruses here. And these are called polyhedral viruses. And they're also a little bit simplistic in structure. So they have the nucleic acid in the center. Again, it could be any of the four different ones. There's actually many other combinations, but um, RNA or DNA, single or double-stranded. And so the nucleic acid is in the center and then it's surrounded by a more complex capsid. Um, so the proteins can organize into different shapes and sizes. And um, this is called the polyhedral 
uh, type viruses. And there could be up to 20 plus sides on this particular virus. An example of this virus is the adenovirus or the adenovirus, which causes um, the common respiratory illnesses a lot of times in immunocompromised patients, actually in all kinds of species, uh, there's adenoviruses. The third category is um, exemplified here by the influenza virus. And this, these are the enveloped viruses. This is the, in here, you can see that there's an RNA nucleic acid, the genome surrounded by this green capsid protein. It's not really green in nature, it's just the picture. Um, um, and then it's surrounded here, this is the envelope. So the blue represents those uh, specialized fats, those phospholipids. And then these are the specialized proteins, the glycoproteins that are used for attachment. The coronaviruses, the family of coronaviruses fits in here. So SARS and MERS and our COVID-19, those are all, um, they're actually all RNA viruses that are, have an envelope. And the last category is kind of the catch-all category for all of the viruses um, that don't fit into those other three categories. So I told you in the beginning that I study a bacterial virus that um, infects bacteria and not harm or infect humans. And that falls into this category. And it kind of looks like this a little bit. It has a head region with the double-stranded DNA. Mine has double-stranded DNA, the virus I study. Um, it has this kind of complex, looks kind of like a lunar landing vessel kind of thing. Um, some people call it a spider. And so it attaches to the bacterial host um, with these tail fibers. So this is um, a cross-section of the coronavirus. And so you can see in the coronavirus, it has RNA and then this N protein um, binds right to it. So these two are always in association with each other, the capsid and the RNA in the case of the coronavirus. And then this is the envelope. So we have this spike glycoprotein and these HR proteins here, these glycoproteins. And these are the characteristic of the crown that we see. That's what corona means, corona means crown. And when we look at it under the microscope or the electron microscope, it has a kind of a crown-like image and that's where the name coronavirus came from. So this goes back to the question that I asked in the very beginning about are viruses alive? And you can ask a scientist or a researcher, um, is a virus a living thing? And, and, and the answer could be maybe, sometimes, and it depends on its location. So if a virus is outside of a cell, it's called a viral particle and it's inert. Um, it, it, on its own, it can't reproduce itself. Um, for that matter, it can't produce anything at all. So it, it's really the ultimate parasite. And so it's, it's a seemingly simple question whether or not viruses are alive. And to answer that, I think what we need to do is kind of step back and think about what are some of the characteristics of, of that all living things share. And so if you think about that, all living things reproduce, all living things grow, all living things metabolize, meaning that they can extract food from the environment and turn it into energy to help fuel itself. It undergoes homeostasis, which means that it keeps some type of regulated internal environment inside a cell or inside a living organism. Um, it can respond to stimuli. If you, you know, pinch me or, you know, that'll, that'll hurt. I'll, I'll pull away. If I touch something hot, I'll pull away. Um, and I have organization. I have some kind of internal structure like cells and cells become tissues and tissues become organs and organs become organ systems. Viruses don't have an organization. They don't necessarily respond to stimuli. They don't metabolize and they can't reproduce or grow. Um, so they can't reproduce without a host. So I think really viruses are not considered alive. However, they do have a huge impact on living things on earth. And so it's, you can, it's hard to exclude them because of the, the effects that they've had on living things. And so if you think about it, um, we've had pandemics through eons, right? There's always been pandemics. Um, since, since organisms have 
had viruses associated with them or bacterial cells associated with them, they have, you know, even eliminated species at some point in, in, in time. Um, one of the interest, other interesting things about viruses is they can directly exchange genetic material either with themselves or with their host. And so remember I told you I work with a virus. So the virus that I work with can insert its, gen its genetic material, its genome into the host, the bacterial host. And when it excises and starts to replicate, it can take with it about 10% of the, the bacterial genome. So it can move genes all over the place, um, or it can become a permanent part of the host genome and add genes to, um, to the repertoire of the host. And I really, really like the quote that um, is from this uh, Scientific American writer. And he writes in an article from 2008 that the huge population of viruses combined with their rapid rates of rep rep replication and mutation makes them the world's leading source of genetic innovation. They constantly invent new genes and unique genes of viral origin may travel, finding their way into other organisms and contributing to evolutionary change. And that is so true. And, and it's something to really think about as we can, you know, as we're living in, in a pandemic where viruses are infecting our cells on a daily basis. So what are some, um, some common viruses? So I went back to look at the prevalence of viral infections worldwide. And this is human, human infection worldwide. And then I put it into a word cloud format just to see what um, the prevalence of viruses are. And now I did this two weeks ago, but as you can see um, from the word cloud, influenza is pretty, pretty prevalent. Um, rotavirus, rotavirus is a childhood respiratory disease. If you have children in daycare, um, probably are familiar with rotavirus. Varizella zoyster is the virus that causes uh, chicken pox and then recurs as shingles um, later on in a reoccurring infection. Um, I have COVID-19 here um, and I did this two weeks ago, so it's probably a little bit bigger at this point. Um, here's Norwalk virus, which is commonly called the, uh, the cruise ship virus. If you know anybody that's ever been on a cruise that had to dock because people were sick, um, and quarantine because people were sick, that's, that was your, um, your friend, the Norwalk virus. So how do viruses replicate? Um, what does a viral life cycle look like? And so um, on this slide, you can see that there's five steps and the most critical step in terms of infection is attachment. And attachment happens when a virus most likely a protein on the surface of a virus, recognizes a protein on the surface of a cell. And so there has to be that specificity in order for the virus to successfully attach and infect the cell. So if um, you don't have the receptor for the virus on the surface of your cells, that virus can come and go and you'll never get infected by that virus. So attachment is important. And once the virus attaches to a host cell, its, gene net, its genetic materials, nucleic acid, enters into the host cell. And it then basically commandeers the cell. It commandeers the replication machinery and the protein synthesis machinery. And all it does is it directs the cell to make copies of the virus, its DNA or its RNA, its nucleic acid, and then proteins, make the proteins, that, the capsid proteins and the tail fibers that make up the virus. And then the virus gets assembled inside the host. And then the virus can be released. And it, there's one of two ways that pr primary ways that viruses get released from the cell. One is it can just make uh, so many copies, hundreds and hundreds of copies, and it just bursts the cell. That's called lysis. Um, another way it gets out is by budding. And this is a trans um, mission electron micrograph of the isolate from the first US COVID patient in the US. And you can see that this is a eukaryotic, this is their cell. And then here, these are the coronavirus particles that are kind of coming out of this vesicle here. So these are being released into the, into the local environment of the patient, of the, of the host. 
So where do these viruses come from? So this is a whole field of, of subfield of immunology called emerging infectious diseases. And so it's, it's a process called zoonosis and it's actually a natural process. And it occurs from what scientists call spillover infections. Um, and it's a normal process of evolution and natural selection. And we're seeing more and more of these zoonoses, these emerging infectious diseases, because we are getting, there's more and more of us, right? There's more people populating the earth. And as more and more people populate the earth, the natural habitats of animals is getting smaller and smaller. And the intersection of people and, and, and animals and their habitats is getting crossed. And animals, as I said before, always have had viruses, right? There's always been viruses for all species. And the viruses do the same thing in animals as they do to us, right? They'll, they'll get into our cells, They'll make us sick and we either recover or we don't. Um, and so those viruses, they, they replicate really fast. They have options to mutate. And normally we never come in contact with those viruses. But as we're getting closer and closer together, um, there's more and more opportunities for the intersection of viruses from animals and humans and viruses from humans to come in contact with each other. So that's kind of how these viruses emerge. And, and for, um, for SARS and for MERS, we know, and, and we suspect for a COVID-19 that originated in bats. Bats have a lot of identified coronaviruses. You can go into gene sequence databases and see that there's lots of coronaviruses and they've been identified as bat um, viruses. And they think that the virus mutated enough so that it had an intermediate host. And in the case of the MERS, um, we know that those, that intermediate host was a camel and then that camels got the virus and then the virus mutated again and it became susceptible to humans. And remember, it, it's that susceptibility, that attachment that needs to happen in order for the virus to be susceptible. And so there was a mutation that allowed the virus to now bind to cells in camels and then bind to cells in humans. And, and they think that this pangolin was the reservoir from the bat to the pangolin to COVID-19. There's still ongoing studies to see whether or not that's true or not, but um, that's kind of what is the, um, emerging as a hypothesis as to how um, COVID-19 manifested itself. So how do we get sick? Um, so um, what we, what we know happens is that the pathogen, right, it's a virus, so it needs a reservoir, it needs a host. And so um, I like this schematic because it talks about how the process works. And so um, you can imagine yourself as the, um, as a person, let's imagine yourself, um, you're really, really nice and you're giving your friend a, um, a ride to work. Um, and so that you decide to carpool. But yeah, so your friend is a reservoir. Unfortunately, your friend has the flu. And so the pathogen in this case is the flu. And as long as your friend sits in your car and doesn't breathe, I don't know how long your commute is, maybe it's five minutes, maybe it's 45 minutes, 45 minutes, forget it, right? Um, you're in the car, um, there's a pathogen there. As long as it stays within the reservoir, it's fine. But Unfortunately, your friend has the flu, so they sneeze. So now the pathogen has a way out through the nose, the transmission through the sneeze. Now you can hold your breath maybe until you get to where you need to go. So don't breathe for it, but if your commute's 45 minutes, that's a problem. And you have a smart car, so it's really small, right? So um, you breathe in and now you're the susceptible host. And um, the question is, do you get the flu? Um, and the answer to that question is maybe. Um, it depends, right? Depends on how much of a dose did you get? How many viral particles did you get? Um, how strong was the virus dose, right? How strong is your immune system, right? Your immune system is great, right? Um, because the job of your immune system is to fight off infection, to fight off disease. And um, I, I really like this slide because it's, you know, it has the immune system on one page, one slide. But so this is your flu virus here. This is the antigen. And you're inside your immune system. Um, you have lots of defense mechanisms. And the primary, the first line of defense are these cells called APC. And so these APC cells, their job is to surveil. So they, 
they're, they're in your mucous membranes, they're in your bloodstream, they're in your lymphatic system, and their job is to circulate through your body and detect anything that's not normal, any foreign invaders. Um, so if it comes across a foreign invader, it does um, what it's supposed to do and it recruits a whole bunch of friends. So its job is to recognize foreign, foreign bodies. So it recognizes this antigen, says this is foreign, and then recruits a whole bunch of friends. And so one host of friends are called T helper cells. And the T helper cells, the job of the T helper cells is to bring everybody to the party and recruit. And so T helper cells bring macrophages or macrophages to the party and they are giant eating machines. So whoop, 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 something bad, macrophage comes and eats it up, kind of like a Pac-Man. Killer cells are recruited by helper cells too. And killer T cells produce a whole bunch of, of, of proteins and enzymes. Some, some of them are called cytokines. And cytokines can go and destroy proteins, viruses, and uh, RNA, DNA. So it produces a whole bunch of uh, chemicals that will help destroy foreign invaders. The other things that T helper cells do is they recruit B cells. And B cells are really important. And having B, having B cells activated does two really important things. The first thing it does is it starts making antibodies against the virus, right? And we need lots of, and so it floods it with neutralizing antibodies and the virus goes away. The other important thing that this process does is it creates B memory cells. And B memory cells are really important because what happens is that when you um, see this virus again, you bypass all of these steps here and go right to this. So you start making lots and lots of antibodies really, really quickly. And you may or may not get any symptoms at all the second time you see the same type of virus. Now it has to be the same one, right? Because we have a memory cell of that particular one. Um, other ways that we are finding cures or treatments for, for, for um, viral infections is using antiviral drugs, um, vaccine development. Um, there are several uh, vaccines currently in phase three clinical trials for COVID-19. And there's some very promising um, uh, vaccines in terms of development for that. Um, the one take home message that I want you guys to get from this talk is I put not antibiotics. Um, antibiotics are used to treat bacterial infections. If you suspect you have a viral infection, don't take an antibiotic, it won't work. Those drugs are targeted to the cell membrane or the replication system of bacteria, not a virus. So this last, the second, to, the second to last slide, um, is the synthesis of remdesivir. And remdesivir was uh, invented by a chemist at Gilead Pharmaceutical. And it was originally developed for um, treatment of Ebola, but it turned out that it worked against uh, MERS uh, outbreak in, um, in 2012. So they're trying it now to see whether or not remdesivir will be effective against um, against COVID-19 and how it's interacting with the virus. And so um, I know that the moderators did tell you that there'll be a survey at the end, but there's also a quiz. So make sure you figure out that replication, that, that, that synthesis process. I'm just kidding. There won't be, there will not be a quiz at the end. Well, there'll be a survey, but no quiz. Um, and I did want to end um, by just talking about some of the positive things and not all viruses are bad. There are have been some um, interesting studies and, and, and progress about um, using viruses for treatments. And so um, the microbiome has been a common thing that I think people know about in terms of your gut health and things like that. So it turns out that you have um, protective viruses in your uh, mucous membranes, in your uh, digestive tract, in your rest, um, respiratory tract that contain viruses. And it's thought that these viruses are actually part of our immune system and their job is to protect uh, the human body from invading bacteria. Um, there's also been uh, several reports about using viruses in um, sepsis. So uh, people who are infected with bacterial infections that um, don't respond to antibiotics because the, the bacteria that they are infected with is resistant to those antibiotics. Um, so, uh, physicians have used um, specific viruses to um, inject into those patients, and those patients have recovered. Um, 
from the bacterial infection because the viruses killed the bacteria when the antibiotics didn't work. And then one of this new technology, in fact, there was just an article, a story on the Today Show this morning that talked about CRISPR technology. And CRISPR technology actually comes from, uh, from, from viruses, that the, the process of um, cutting out, specifically cutting out uh, damaged DNA and replacing it with um, healthy or normal DNA, or wild type DNA, is the technique that comes from CRISPR. Um, so bacteria are not bad. They, they do have some beneficial um, advances. And I think in the next 10 or 15 years, we'll see this CRISPR technology more commonplace. Um, so I, I do want to open it up to see if there's any questions. Um, I did put on this slide um, two uh, really good sites for COVID-19. I'm not a physician, so um, a disclaimer there, but these two sites are really good. They have a lot of information about the, uh, and they're up to date about COVID-19. One is the CDC website, and the other one is the Penn State Virus Information.psu.edu website. And this is a slide, uh, my uh, research student who's now at the NIH is, um, it did made a cake, uh, a virus cake for, um, for a, a contest that he entered. I don't know if he won, but it's kind of cool. So, and I will stop there and ask, see if there's any questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Meislewick. That is such fantastic information. Um, the thing that I wrote down that I took away, which there's probably more, but I took away not all viruses are bad. So I thought that was a really important thing, especially in light of what we're dealing with in society today. So, um, so for our audience, please feel free to start populating our Q&A with some questions and uh, Sonia will start to facilitate those. Uh, but I will let everybody know that we will be posting that last slide somewhere in our website, in our archives with the recording of this chat if you're interested in, in getting those, those links down the line. So Sonia, take it away. Great. Uh, our first question is, is the attachment process the reason why some people are asymptomatic and some people get very sick? That's a really good question. And I wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, so I think it has to do a lot with genetics, right? So the genetics make the proteins that are on the surface of the cell. And I think we don't know that much enough about the virus, the, at least the COVID virus um, to say that. But um, if you think about the importance of how attachment and viral recognition and specificity play out, then most likely it's good to, I would think that that was a good surmise, that that was probably true. And again, people with um, stronger immune systems may have, or an, a, a, a different response to one of those arms in that um, immunology slide I showed could be why some people are asymptomatic and some people get really sick. But it, it, it comes down to genetics, I, I think. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Meiselwick. Um, our next question is specificity was mentioned as important for attachment. Do we know what the COVID-19 attaches to in humans? I did just read that. Ah, oh, I can't. Yes, it's the ACE protein. So ACE is the name of the protein receptor on the surface of the cells. And there's different versions of that. So that could go back to the question that um, was just asked. So maybe there's variations of that in different people. Um, so it's the ACE receptor on the surface of cells. Wow, that was like a double jeopardy question there. Good job, Dr. Meislewick. Okay, so the next question is, um, also, is there a known range of viral particles that will make someone become sick? A few? A million? So that, again, plays into, um, there's a, that, that's a loaded question, too. Um, it depends on the dosage. It depends on your immune response. It depends on the virus and how well it replicates inside of cells. And so that varies from virus type to virus type. Um, there are um, differences in how many viral particles we get, whether or not you get a strong response or a weak response. So, and, and it's different for every single virus, right? So, so for example, um, some viruses are much more communicable than others. So you only need a couple to get really sick. Some viruses last really long time on inanimate objects. 
subjects and some don't, right? So there's a lot of factors that determine that. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, I, I believe it did. If, if it did not, please feel free to submit another question. Um, yes, I actually have a question of my own. Um, without sounding a little too much like Buddy the Elf, uh, what's your favorite virus? I mean, not like you like the impact of these viruses, but I know that you mentioned that you study a virus similar to the spider virus. So what, what should, what's the most fascinating virus to you? I think the, the, the I think there, I think the process of virology is what's most fascinating to me. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite, it's like picking a favorite kid. I don't know if you could do that. Right? Oh, we can. <laughs> oh, we can. <laughs> My kids are listening, listening right now. <laughs> oh, no. Right? Um, no, I think, you know, I, I, the fact, and, and it goes back to that quote that I, I, I read, the fact, the marvel of their process is what I find fascinating. Dr. Meisluck, I actually have a question for you, if, if that's okay, Sonia. You already asked me a question, so you're, <laughs> at, you're at your limit. All right, well, just maybe one more. Um, I know you're not a physician, and this is not specifically your training, and this is still so new, but do you have an opinion or anything to offer about whether there will be a vaccine for COVID-19 sooner or later? Do you have any so, so, so yes, I think there will be. Um, one of the things I quickly went through one of the slides and one of the, the, the nice thing, if, if you want to call something nice, right? One of the really interesting things is that there's only been five variants thus far of the COVID. And so what I mean of COVID-19, so what I mean by that, when they isolated a, a, a virus from Wuhan and then they isolated a virus from Italy and then isolated one from Portugal and the US and they, they sequenced those viruses. And these viruses are really big. They're 30,000 um, kill kilobases, which is pretty big for a virus. Um, I don't know how to put that in perspective. Um, they're, they're pretty big. <laughs> um, but um, there's only been five variants. So if you look at the sequence of Wuhan and the sequence of the US, there's not a lot of ch genetic change in that, which is good if you're trying to find a vaccine and the way the vaccine works is it elicits that whole host of immune responses so that when you see the virus again, you get that quick rapid memory to come back. So vaccines develop memory B cells for you so that when you get exposed again, you have that rapid response of neutralizing antibodies. So okay. um, typically antivirals and, and vaccine development takes years, years. And the fact that we have three phase three clinical trials already within six, it's June, yeah, within six months. I mean, this virus was really first identified in November of 2019. So, you know, it's been only eight months. And the fact that we have clinical trials going, um, I think is fabulous. I think we will have a vaccine. Um, we won't have herd immunity like people are talking about. We'll, we'll have a vaccine, I think, before we have that. All right, thank you. Okay, we have several more questions coming in. Um, okay. So I apologize if you might have already answered this, but I want our audience's voices to be heard. So are you aware of any research looking into the frequency degree of mutations for COVID-19 from original patient to current patients? Yes. So um, I actually went to a webinar yesterday um, that um, has looked at that. And so at, at the, in the webinar, so again, there hasn't been a lot of variation in the, gene, in the sequences of the genomes from um, COVID-19 that's been identified in Wuhan across the, across the globe. And so that's good for vaccine development. Um, and it's also um, what's bad about it though, is the variations are in that spike protein and the, the one that's kind of sticks up, that glycoprotein that's important for attachment, that's where that variation happens. And that's where the variation happened when um, it jumped from the, the bat to the pangolin to the humans, right? It's that attachment site that becomes problematic. And so that's where the variation happens. So if the, if the, um, if the vaccines are targeted to that, that could be a problem. But usually we have multivalent vaccines. So the, that vaccines really um, target more than just one spot. Um, so I, I think we're still good. I, I, I have, I have um, 
positive optimism. I think that's a that's two of the same words, but you know what I mean. I, I know what you mean. <laughs> um, well, another question that came in: um, Does that mutation that you referenced make it more hard to cure or find a vaccine for? I don't think it will be hard, especially since there's so many groups working on something. We'll find something. They're not all using the glycoprotein, the spike protein as their antigen to target. There are other types of therapies that are out there that are, you know, targeting the RNA or targeting the capsid protein, that, that N protein. So I think um, there's so many vested um, research groups now that um, I, I think the fact that they're aware of that variation, I think is probably more important at this point. Okay, so another question came in. Um, is there a best starting point in development of vaccines? For example, do researchers think interrupting the attachment process creates the greatest likelihood for success? Um, that depends. <laughs> so um, again, there's so many variations in the viruses um, that may, right, and mutation rates and replication rates. Um, so one of the problems with, um, with um, COVID patients is that, um, they over respond, their, their immune systems actually overact. And so that becomes problematic as well. So it's kind of a fine line. And um, I attended a research um, uh, talk one time and the person that I was, he was one of, my, actually who's a mentor of mine and he was on my thesis committee. And he prefaced it by saying, this talk's gonna be about immunology, the dark side of science. And, and that's because there's so many things we don't know all right, and everybody's immune system is a little bit different. It, it, it's, it, it's kind of hard to make steadfast conclusions about individual viruses and individual immune systems and the individual immune response that you're gonna get from um, a treatment. Okay, and you might've just alluded to this a little bit, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. What part of the virus makes it so difficult to find a vaccine for it? I don't think it's difficult at all. I think it just takes time. Um, and the fact that we are there in nine months, I think is fascinating, um, we, right? Um, when we first started to see patients that were sick, that had this kind of immune, that this pneumonia-like phenomenon, we didn't know what it was. We didn't even know, it could have been bacteria at first, right? It could have been a weird allergic reaction to something. And it, the fact that we have so much knowledge, which my, by no stretch of the imagination, is it a lot, but it's so much in such a short period of time. I think scientists should be commended on how much information they have found out about this virus in really such a, I mean, nine months doesn't sound like a long time, but in, in the way research works, nine months is a snap of, snap of the fingers. One of our audience members is also um, asking, do you think uh, that technology is um, limiting our ability to find the vaccine for it or develop a vaccine for it? I'm not sure. If we're limited by our technology or technology has limitations to it and that's why the vaccine <laughs> I hasn't think been created yet? I mean, I think at some point we'll be able to more rapidly screen for, um, you know, possible drug candidates when we're talking about vaccines, but uh, we're not there yet. And I think maybe, you know, in 10 years when we have faster um, computers that can generate algorithms that can model um, what viruses, proteins look like and, 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 and figure out which the best, um, antibody or antiviral drug to make. I, I mean, I think computer modeling needs to um, move a lot forward, a lot more, a lot further. Mm -hmm. um, and if we could do that faster, I think that would speed up the process for sure. So uh, leading right into it, that's like our audience knows. Do you have a guess for when a vaccine might be available? And why do you think people are afraid to receive vaccines, especially new ones? Yeah, you know, so I'm a member of the American Society for Microbiology and they just, I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but um, it's sitting in my inbox and they just sent a um, notice to their members about how to respond to questions about vaccines. And so to be honest, I haven't read it yet, but you know, I, I think vaccines have saved millions and millions and millions of lives. Um, and, you know, it, it, but again, it's an individual immune response to a foreign body. So it, there are chances, right? But 
millions of people have been saved by vaccines. And I can't stress that enough. So uh, the next question was, what would you tell people if they're concerned that the virus will make them sick, but it's the same as the virus? So that's, that's your advice. Like, maybe there's like more of a cost benefit analysis here. Look at- Oh, get a vaccine, done. get get vaccinated and, and get your flu vaccine every year, flu vaccine. <laughs> if you've ever had the flu, you, you, you'll want to get the vaccination, yes. There you go, people, <laughs> you hear. <laughs> um, and don't take antibiotics if you have a viral infection. They don't work. <laughs> All right. messages. Next Two. question. Um, do you believe that due to the five variations, a patient previously sick and recovered will be able to get sick again, but with a different variation than when previously sick? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, uh, whew, that depends. That depends on the person. It depends on their immune response. It depends on what antibody they have kind of stored in their memory cell. How, right? I, I don't know the answer to that. I wish I, I wish I did. Okay, we'll work on that for the next line side check. All right, you. fair enough. Okay. Um, how is a vaccine different than an antibody treatment? So a vaccine is, 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 is your body making those antibodies. And so antibodies are proteins. And so if you give somebody antibodies um, into their bloodstream, those antibodies are short-lived, right? They have a half-life. So they won't stay there forever. A vaccination... Um, will have a longer lasting, most likely, right? Disclaimer, most likely a longer lasting effect because um, from that slide I showed you, you generated that memory cell, that B cell that's kind of hiding in the bloodstream and ready to kind of go at it if it, if it comes in contact with um, a viral particle again. So um, vaccines longer lived, antibody treatment's good um, because you can get a whole bunch, but they're very short lived. Okay, um, this is from one of our audience members. I'm understanding through my study of supply chains um, is that new vaccines will likely require cold supply chains as milk requires a cold supply chain. Will there likely be a living organism needed in a vaccine even though a virus itself isn't living? You mean to generate, they mean to generate the antibodies like they used to do in, um, with chicks and um, eggs, eggs for the flu vaccine, right? So people who, um, they used to use chickens to generate flu vaccine. And so people who were allergic to eggs couldn't get the flu vaccine because they had an allergic reaction to the vaccine, not because of the flu, but because of the way they generated it. And they don't do, um, from what I understand, modern vaccines are based on gene sequences and developed synthetically. So in a bacterium probably to make lots of, vaccines. Okay, great. Um, we have a couple more questions, but we're coming up on time. Dawn? Yeah, I was going to um, pop in right now and see if you want to just pick one more question for us, Sonia, for uh, Tammy to answer, and then I'll come back to wrap us up. Okay, so um, this might be um, a good one to end on. So what are the challenges with associating virus immunity to antibody testing? Associating virus immunity to antibody testing. So having the virus doesn't necessarily mean you're making antibodies to it. So again, think about it from that image I showed you. The virus has to attach. It has to start making lots of virus. You're not making antibodies for several days um, or weeks even, depending on the initial dosage of what, um, of the amount of virus that you've gotten or your specific immune response. So you could have viral particles, viruses, um, and detect those viruses in your bloodstream before you have antibody production. Does that make sense? So people who are looking at testing are looking at both looking for viral, they look, they look for the RNA basically in, in blood samples or they look for antibodies, e either one of those. Um, and you re really kind of need both, right? Because you could test, you're looking for antibodies, you could be a carrier making viruses and, and spreading viruses without having an immune response. And that's why asymptomatic carriers are problematic for, um, for COVID-19 because they're making virus and shedding virus, but they don't have any symptoms. So they're not necessarily making antibodies. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Meislick, for reminding us all that it is indeed a small world after all. It is. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to our tech tutor, uh, Connor, who was uh, joining us today. And uh, thank you for standing by. Um, I'm glad we didn't need you, but it was nice to have the security blanket that you were there. And everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. As you click out of our webinar, you will receive an access, code, or access link to a survey. Please take five minutes to give us some feedback on our chat and provide us some options and ideas for future chats as well. You can reach us at our website, which is on the slide on your screen, and send us an email. You can also see some of our up next of our Lion Shy chats coming up one week from tonight uh, will be our next time. Um, I'm also excited to let you know that in the next two weeks, we'll have a, present, a presentation from a student. So we're looking forward to widening our um, list of presenters with you. So please be sure to check out and come back to meet with our faculty, staff, and students. And stay safe, Berks and beyond. And signing off until next time, this has been Penn State Berks Line Side Chats. Thank you so much. <laughs>